A reading from the book of the prophet Zechariah. I, Zechariah, raised my eyes and looked. There was a man with a measuring line in his hand. I asked, where are you going? He answered, to measure Jerusalem, to see how great is its width and how great its length. Then the angel who spoke with me advanced, and another angel came out to meet him and said to him, Run, tell this to that young man. People will live in Jerusalem as though in open country because of the multitude of men and beasts in her midst. But I will be for her an encircling wall of fire, says the Lord, and I will be the glory in her midst. Sing and rejoice, O daughter Zion. See, I am coming to dwell among you, says the Lord. Many nations shall join themselves to the Lord on that day, and they shall be his people, and he will dwell among you. The word of the Lord. The Lord will guard us as a shepherd guards his flock. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Proclaim it on distant isles and say, He who scattered Israel now gathers them together. He guards them as a shepherd guards his flock. The Lord will guard us as a shepherd guards his flock. The Lord shall ransom Jacob. He shall redeem him from the hand of his conqueror, shouting, They shall mount the heights of Zion. They shall come streaming to the Lord's blessings. Then the virgins shall make merry and dance, and young men and old as well. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will console and gladden them after their sorrows. Dominus Fabiscum, <clears throat> Lexia Sancti Evangelii Secundum Luca. While they were all amazed at his every deed, Jesus said to his disciples, pay attention to what I am telling you. The Son of Man is to be handed over to men. But they did not understand this saying. Its meaning was hidden from them, so that they should not understand it. And they were afraid to ask him about this saying. Verbum Domini. Jesus really adds an emphasis to the point he's making here. He says, pay attention to what I am telling you. The Son of Man is to be handed over to men. 
And then we're told that they did not understand this saying, and that they were amazed at his every deed, seeing the power of God. If you look, this is uh, verses chapter 9, Luke's Gospel 43 to 45. What happens just before this, we have the sending out of the 12, told to take nothing, given power and authority over demons and to cure all diseases and to proclaim the mission and pro proclaim the kingdom. And there's this great urgency in their mission. We're told that Herod himself was perplexed after hearing about the deeds of Jesus. We have the miraculous feeding of the 5,000. We have Peter's confession. Jesus asked him, who do you say that I am? Peter says correctly, the Messiah. And then we have the first passion prediction. This is the second one in this passage, but the first one that he has to suffer, die, and rise again. And we have a teaching about discipleship that we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow him. Then you have the transfiguration. Jesus appears in glory uh, with that glory radiating from within. And he hears the voice, they hear the voice of the Father. This is my beloved son, listen to him. Then we have the healing of a boy with a demon and the father complains that the disciples could not do this and Jesus seemingly like in agony or anguish or frustration says, oh faithless and perverse generation, how long will I be with you and endure you? Complaining about their lack of faith. And then we have today's passage and then right after this, the disciples are arguing about who is the greatest, right? After Jesus complains about their lack of faith, they're saying, who is the greatest? We had a guest here at the network one time that worked with Mother Teresa, and he said, I think it was Croatia, he was in a helicopter with Mother Teresa flying over the beautiful countryside of Croatia. And he and Mother Teresa are looking out of the the window and they're marveling at how beautiful the countryside is. And Mother Teresa tells him and says, you know, it's easy for us to understand the power, the majesty of God, but it's hard for us to understand the humility of God. That God would lower himself, that the word would become flesh, become one of us, unite himself to all of us in a mysterious way and then suffer and die for us. That's hard for us to, to get how God would do that. But Peter, after Pentecost, puts it very strongly in his, his preaching after Pentecost. He says, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan of God and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men emphasizing that this is the plan of God. He allowed this, that he, at all moments in time are present to him, even our free will decisions, God knows what we're going to do and allows this to happen. Isaiah 53, the suffering servant songs, you know, prophesied hundreds of years before Christ says he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, upon him was the chastisement that made us whole, and by his stripes we are healed. By his, the lashes that he received, his sufferings, we are healed, we are redeemed. So the Paschal mystery, Jesus, by making these passion predictions, He's saying that this isn't a result of chance or unfortunate circumstances, or this isn't God losing control of things, so to speak. This is the plan of God, that lawless men rejected him and crucified him, and he suffered and died for our sins. This mysterious substitution of his obedience for Adam's 
disobedience. And this obedience to the Father's will out of love. That love is what gives the value to that suffering death and resurrection for us. He was obedient unto death on a cross, Philippians 2.8. And as disciples, Jesus teaches us that we're called to share in that suffering. To be a disciple means to take up our cross, you know, then follow him. Now, First Peter chapter 2 talks about how he left us an example of what we are to do. And we see this clearly in Mary. We're celebrating a votive mass in honor of the Blessed Mother that her suffering at the foot of the cross shares in our redemption. And I think it, it almost makes a stronger point. There's one thing you can see like the apostles being sent out doing this mission and they get martyred. And Mary, you see it, that she is there in the most pure form suffering with Christ, you know, at the foot of his cross as a mother, of course, united with her son, being his mother in a special way, a bond, suffers there in her compassion that a sword was to pierce her heart or her soul, as Sibian prophesied, that she shared in his suffering in this deep mystical way, standing in faith as a mother before her crucified son, is a model for all of us that we share in these sufferings. And I think oftentimes our understanding, because it is hard for us to understand this humility and suffering of God, that, you know, with our own crosses, we come to learn in the value of that suffering, you know, through obedience, that we experience his power and his presence in our life, that he's sustaining us, that he draws close to us in that cross, and he's transforming us and doing his greatest work on us in our own personal transformation and our own growth and holiness. I heard a beautiful reflection recently on Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, remember from the book of Daniel, there are these uh, faithful Jews living in Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar's persecuting them, getting, trying to get them to bow down before the false gods. And, and they say, you know, they heat up this fiery furnace, threatening to throw them in. And they tell him, they said, you know, our, our God, the God of Israel, the one true God, he can deliver us. But if not, we will not serve your gods. If he doesn't deliver us, we're not going to bow down before your gods. So they throw them into the furnace, <laughs> and even the guards, some of them perished. The furnace was so hot. And they're thrown in there, and they're singing hymns of praise to God. And Nebuchadnezzar himself looks into that furnace and sees the three, but he also sees what he describes as the Son of God there with them in the furnace, that there's a fourth one with them in the furnace, the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah. He has taken up that cross and he is with us. And whatever crucible we find ourselves in, he's strengthening us. And we're starting to understand that Paschal mystery in a deeper way that these things in our life have great value, that Jesus showed us the path of redemption as being through the cross. And he does great things. He draws our fruitfulness out of this, and he strengthens us in that cross.